Hey guys, this is a real life review of the Canon EOS R10, which is an entry level crop sensor mirrorless camera. In this video, I'm going to go through the main specs of the Canon R10 and put it into different real life situations to see how it handles, how the autofocus holds up, how good the image quality is, and I will also briefly test the 18 to 45 mm kit lens that comes with it. And of course, as I'm mostly into night photography, I will show you the high ISO and dynamic range performance as well. Hi, my name is Miklos Meyer, and my channel is all about photography. So if you'd like to take better photos, this is the right place for you. And please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so you will not miss any of my new content. The Canon R10 was introduced together with the more professional R7 in 2022 and Canon positioned the R10 to be an entry-level camera but since then the even cheaper R50 and R100 was also introduced. So what makes the R10 an entry-level camera? Well the R10 has only 24 megapixel resolution sensor, it doesn't have as high quality body and it has only one memory card slot it has less professional video features, no headphone jack, and most importantly, it does not have an image stabilized sensor. But I don't think that the lack of IBIS is a big deal because most of the RF lenses, especially the kit lenses, have image stabilization in them. Apart from this, most of the R10's features are exactly the same as the R7. So the R10 also has a crazy speed of 15 frames per second with mechanical shutter, 23 frames per second with electronic shutter, which is by the way completely silent, and the autofocus is exactly the same professional AF system used as in the high-end Canon cameras. The awesome autofocus that finds the eyes of people and animals is one of the key selling points of all mirrorless cameras and that's why I always tell people to switch to mirrorless simply because the autofocus features are so much better. So for the R10 it is really a key selling point. The Canon R10 has the RF lens mount so it can only take RF type lenses. Please don't forget that the RF mount is different from the M mount that the M50 cameras use so you cannot put on EF-M lenses to the R10. However, you can buy an EF to R adapter and most of the EF mount Canon and third-party lenses will work fine, the autofocus will remain exactly as fast. In this review, I mostly tested the R10 with its 18 to 45 millimeter kit lens, but you will also see some images taken with the 18 to 150 millimeter kit lens as well. And later on in the video, we are going to pixel peep at the image quality of these lenses. Let's have a look at the body and the controls of the EOS R10. I really like that the camera feels very light, but I didn't like the cheap plastic feel it has in my hands. It's very hard to describe, but it has a, like a plasticky feel to it. It feels like if I gripped it very tightly, the camera would just crack. Why I'm emphasizing is that with my Nikon Z50, I don't have this feeling, but with the R10, I have this plasticky feeling. I'm sorry, Canon. The R10 has a nice, proper grip. It's not too thick, but as with all mirrorless cameras today in this category, your pinky finger is going to float in the air as you are holding the camera. On top of the camera you have the main control dial as usual with Canons, so if you are in aperture priority mode you can control the aperture with this dial. Next to it you have a customizable M function button. Personally I really like this button, it's very well placed and by default it can act as a multi-function dial setting, but I can also assign any function to it in the menu. So for example, I can set this to magnify into the live view, which is great when shooting with a manual focus lens. On 
or I can assign five star rating to it. So when I'm browsing the images, I just press the MFN button and the image gets a five star rating. So when I put the images into Lightroom, I can immediately see which are the images that I highlighted. Then there is the video recording button, which can also be customized similarly. And there's a lock button, which locks the controls. To be honest, I've never ever used the lock button in my 14 years of career in photography. Let me know down in the comments if you ever used it. Then there is the program mode selector dial. Here we can find Canon's exclusive FV, flexible mode, along with the usual other modes. In the flexible mode, you can lock the aperture, shutter speed, exposure compensation and ISO to any given value or leave it on an automatic setting. So for example, now I set the aperture to a fixed value and the ISO to a fixed value as well, 100, but leave the shutter speed on auto, which is essentially an aperture priority mode at ISO 100 and the given aperture. But I can also set the ISO to auto and then the camera will adjust the ISO speed in order to maintain a fast enough shutter speed. Basically, this would be an auto ISO setting coupled with aperture priority mode. By the way, I have a detailed video what auto ISO is and how to use it. Check it out right here. Or I can use it as manual mode if I set everything to a given level and there are so many other variations as well. And next to the on off switch, we have the secondary control dial. If you are in aperture priority mode, then this controls the exposure compensation. Now let's jump to the front of the camera. Next to the lens, there is finally a physical focus switch. I am sure everybody prefers a physical switch when it comes to autofocus or manual focus. As most kit lenses today, like this one as well, it doesn't have an autofocus manual focus switch. So it really made sense to put a physical switch onto the body itself. Nikon should definitely follow this. On the back of the camera we have a joystick which is placed really comfortably just where my thumb naturally points to. You can use this joystick to adjust AF points or to jump between eyes when using IAF. Personally I really liked using this joystick I liked it way much more than the R7's multi-selector dial or whatever they call it. At the bottom of the grip, there goes the battery. This is a pretty small one, by the way, but luckily it comes with a dedicated charger. You can, of course, charge the camera via the camera's USB-C port. Next to the battery, we have the single SD card slot. Unfortunately, the R10 has only one car slot. On the back of the camera, there's an excellent touchscreen that can be tilted completely out to the side. This makes shooting verticals close to the ground really easy, and it is also super helpful when videoing myself. But to be honest, for simple photography, when I'm behind the camera, I prefer the simple tilt up and down mechanism that, that most Nikons have. And I've heard from many of you in the comments that those of you who are serious photographers prefer that up and down tilt mechanism compared to this one. And, and to be honest, I can completely understand that. Anyway, this is a touch screen as it's supposed to be. You can double tap on the images to magnify into them or you can just use normal finger gestures. And of course, the menu is also touch sensitive too. On top of the camera, we have a 2.36 million dot viewfinder. I personally really like using this. The buttons on the back are very well placed and can be easily reached with my thumb. It's great to see that we have dedicated buttons for ISO and also for drive mode. And by the way, all these buttons can be given any other custom function in the menu. As with every Canon camera nowadays, we have the Q menu. And finally, on this camera, the Q menu is different in photo mode than in video mode. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because when you are recording video, you are using completely different settings. For example, in video, you would like to set the audio levels, while when taking photos, this doesn't have any relevancy at all. 
On the side of the camera we find a microphone jack, however there is no headphone jack here. Also there is a remote control jack, a USB-C connector and a mini HDMI port. Now let's see some of the key features of the EOS R10. First of all the autofocus system which is really top of the line is the exact same as in the super high professional Canon R3. I could tell you how many AF points the R10 has, but honestly, who cares? We will be using IAF or and subject tracking most of the time. What matters is that the autofocus can track the subject around almost the whole frame. These white markings mark the edges of the AF area. You can see it's almost the whole frame. What I also like about the AF is that it recognizes the back of people's heads and of course you can switch between the eyes if you want to but in general the R10 automatically picks up the closer eye to focus on which is the correct thing to do because you want to focus on the eye that is closer to you. As you can see it locks onto her eyes from a far distance and tracks it down quite accurately. Of course you need to be in AF servo mode and have subject tracking on. There wasn't really much light here but still the AF did a good job. And the IAF seems to be accurate even when using an f2 lens the focus was right on her eyeballs not on her eyelashes. And the autofocus doesn't only detect humans it can detect birds even in bad lighting. Look how it finds the eyes of the peacock and also a very small bird even through the fence. And of course it finds the eyes of dogs, cats and even aggressive llamas as you can see here. Of course, just because we see the autofocus box appearing at the right place on the eyes doesn't always mean that it will be in focus, but with the Canon R10 I got my shots almost 100% perfectly focused. Thank God the IEF can be further improved. I can limit the area where the camera will find the eyes. So in the AF area selection I go into zone AF and with the dials I can set the height and width of that zone marked by this white box. And now the R10 will only attempt to find eyes within that box. Once it found the eyes then it can track that eye around the whole frame. So not within the box but around the whole frame. The box just tells the camera where to look for the eyes when you half press the shutter button. So this is great for action photography where you want to limit the area where the camera would find the subjects. Oh and by the way you can also find and track cars as well even if they are as small as my son's toys. So is the autofocus all every very good? Well its performance is very good yes but the way it's set up in the menu is really confusing. In the AF menu tab you first have the AF mode selection and the AF area selection that makes perfect sense. However after this things get super confusing. You can select what kind of subject you would like to detect and if IAF should be activated. But wait what is this subject tracking? I am already in AF servo, I already have subject detection and IAF. Of course I want the camera to track the subject. What is this? Why can I turn it on and off? It just doesn't make sense. What's funny is that even if I turn this subject tracking off, the camera still tracks the subject, it just doesn't display the tracking frame. Does this make any sense? Please let me know down in the comments if this makes sense to you. And by the way, here's a little tip for you. If you see this little 
icon, then subject tracking is on. And to be honest, I don't see any reason why it should not be on. Then the confusion continues as I'm going further down. There's the option switching tracked subject. In theory, you would be able to set how sticky the AF should be on the first subject, but in real life, I couldn't see any difference. Switching over the next tab, we can select different AF servo configurations. These configurations are about how sticky and reactive the AF should be, exactly as the switching tracked objects option we saw a second ago. So why are these options separately and also why didn't I see any real difference in the working of the autofocus? So what do you think? Do these settings make any sense or, or did I do something wrong or did I miss something? Let me know down in the comments. The other professional feature of the Canon R10 is its speed. With mechanical shutter, it can shoot up to 15 frames per second. And it can shoot 23 frames per second with electronic shutter. This is almost as fast as video recording, which is 24 frames per second. Of course, with the full electronic shutter, it is completely silent. In the menu, you can select which type of shutter you would like to use. I usually went for the fully electronic or the electronic first curtain. Within the drive mode settings, you have different speed options, but only three, and they are not customizable, unfortunately. One personal complaint I have with the Canon R10 is how the shutter sounds. Listen to this. Uh, the way it sounds to me, it feels really like low quality and cheap and, and fragile. It just sounds, sounds like a toy. In comparison, this is how a Nikon's mechanical shutter sounds. Let's talk about the videos captured with the EOS R10. The R10 really shines when it comes to video recording. But I will have a little rant at the end of this section. As compared to the R7, the R10 doesn't have a dedicated video photo mode switch. Instead, you have to use the mode selector dial and put it into video recording mode. Or you can just start recording a video in any of the photography modes. But in this case, the options are quite limited. To have all the video recording options, you have to turn the dial to movie recording. Now you have a different menu system where you can pick the frame rate, resolution and codec. The good news is that the R10 can record at 4K at 30 frames per second without any cropping. Also with 60 frames per second, but that comes with a quite heavy crop. It's also great that the R10 can capture HDR PQ video files. So these are real HDR footages with 10 bit color depths. Most of the times I was using this HDR PQ option and I really liked the extended dynamic range I got. However, using this option, the camera turns on highlight tone priority and therefore the base ISO jumps up to ISO 200 to capture extra detail in the shadows and in the highlights. Fortunately, we still have the same accurate IAF in video mode it finds and tracks the eyes automatically around the whole frame. We can also shoot videos with 120 frames per second, but then the resolution drops down to full HD. Playing it back at 24 FPS, this is a five times slow motion. As you can see, the autofocus did a fantastic job here again. It tracked her really well. It is also great to see that you can customize the Q menu to your own taste independently from the photography mode. So in video mode, you can have your own Q menu set up. 
For videographers, it's important that the R10 doesn't have in-body image stabilization, but luckily for us, most of the RF mount lenses from Canon, especially the kit lenses that come with this camera, have image stabilization in them. Holding the camera in my hand, I got this footage with the image stabilization enabled. And I got this footage with the electronic image stabilization enabled on top of the optical image stabilization. And here comes my rant about video settings. Do you remember that we used to trash Sony? for having a menu system where everything is scattered around? Well, Canon is making something similar here. Of course, they will say that this isn't a bug, this is a feature. The first bug or feature. When in video mode, you can select which shooting mode you want to use. Auto exposure, where you can only select exposure compensation, nothing else. Or manual, where you can control aperture, shutter speed and ISO independently. This is what I used most of the time. Or you can have HDR video, but don't let this fool you. This is not real 10-bit HDR video as I've shown you earlier. This is just something where the camera kind of extends the dynamic range. So this is not a true HDR video. However, Canon quite confusingly calls it an HDR video. Why? I have no idea. And the second thing that bugs me is that in the menu you first need to go into the wrench icon and set if you would like to use NTSC or PAL system. This kind of makes sense for beginners but if I want to have a slow motion video, I cannot just set it from this menu. No, I have to go back and go into high frame rate, enable it, and then go back to movie recording size and choose the quality of the full HD footage. And when I'm done with the slow motion, and if I want to switch back to normal video recording, 4K, 24 FPS, I have to disable high frame rate and then I have to go back again to the movie recording size and you can see it's full HD. I have to set it again back to 4K 24 FPS. So it's just a lot of extra clicking if I want to change from normal recording to slow-mo recording. On Nikon cameras it's just so much easier. Okay, I get this that most of the users will use the Canon R10 for photography and not for videography, but I'm sure quite many of YouTube creators will buy this camera for its advanced video features. Now let me give you some high-res photos of Budapest to see how good the image quality of the kit lens is. By the way, you can download all these raw images at the first link under the video. For such a cheap and small lens, you cannot really have big expectations, but it performed way better than I thought it would. This is at 18 mm at f4.5. This is very sharp at the center and sharpness slightly drops towards the ed edges, but I would still consider it sharp. Stopping down improves sharpness, of course. And basically it's the same characteristics at other focal lengths as well. The performance is quite even. I was a bit surprised that even at 45 mm, even at its widest aperture, well, <laughs> as wide you can call f6.3, sharpness is generally good across the whole frame. One drawback of the lens is the rather heavy vignetting on the wide end at 18 mm setting. And this is with lens profile corrections turned on. Now let's stop here for a second. I just cannot wrap my head around the fact that Canon cannot put out a kit lens for a crop sensor camera that would give you 24 millimeter equivalent field of view because the kit lens starts from 18 millimeter focal length and the Canons have a crop factor of 1.6. This means that this kit lens at its widest gives you only a 29 millimeter equivalent field of view. This is just not wide enough. I don't know why Canon decides to do this. 
Nikon can put out 60 mm lenses that have 24 mm equivalent field of view. So why can't Canon do that? I think it's a deliberate marketing decision from Canon's part. They just want to push more people towards their full frame lineup. Not to mention the poor wide aperture at 18 mm setting. It is just f4 and a half instead of f3.5 like with Nikon and Sony. So why can't Canon make a faster lens? Why? Okay, that's enough trashing. Uh, th this is an okay lens. It's cheap and small and it has a contractible design. So you have to turn it one way to collapse it and open it the other way and then you can start using it and zooming with it. Obviously it's not a high-end lens, but it's not that bad either as you could see from the sample images. I know that everybody is going to be asking about the battery life. So with a fresh fully charged battery, I was able to take around 600 images and 10 minutes of 4K videos plus 2 minutes of slow motion videos. Now is that good or bad? For a mirrorless camera this size, I think this is average and with with all the other mirrorless cameras, you will need to buy at least one or two spare batteries. This is true across the board for every brand. Let's talk about the image stabilization. Well, the R10 itself doesn't have its sensor stabilized, but the kit lenses have optical image stabilization. Probably it's due to the small size of the 18 to 45 mm lens, but at 18 mm setting, I had to use at least one tenth of a second shutter speed or faster to get sharp results. So that is just like one or one and a half stops advantage. Zooming in into 45 millimeter, I had to use one fifteenth or rather one thirtieth of a second to obtain sharp images handheld. Okay, let's talk about the high ISO performance, how much noise it gets when we bump up the ISO. For this, I went to the St. Stephen's Cathedral, the biggest church in Budapest. I took photos from ISO 100 all the way up to ISO 25600. By the way, you can download all these photos at the link under the video. Of course, at ISO 100, it's clear and virtually noise-free. Let's look at the 3200 ISO shot. This is the edited RAW with sharpening with no noise reduction. Moving it up to ISO 6400, I think it's still all right. It looks as it's supposed to look. The detail is there, and, but some fine noise appears. So I don't know how much these high ISO tests matter in today's age of uh, artificial intelligence technology. Because in Lightroom, I could get rid of the noise almost completely. The denoised ISO 6400 shot looks as noise-free as a normal ISO 200 shot. And this really shows you how much powerful this technology is. I've made a detailed video about Adobe Lightroom's denoising. Check it up right here. Now let's have a look at the dynamic range. In this test, I deliberately underexposed the scene at ISO 100 and then I push it back up in Adobe Lightroom for the correct exposure. So the question is how much you can brighten up the RAW files without introducing too much noise. I was surprised that at ISO 100 the R10 could handle plus three stops of pushing up without any problem. There is hardly any noise here. At plus four stops it's still pretty good. At plus five stops brightening some purplish color cast appears and of course a lot more noise but it's still okay, it's still usable. All in all, this means that the R10 handles underexposure really well. So the R10 is a perfect choice for night photography. So summarizing it up, I think the Canon R10 is an excellent choice for those people who would like to get into the world of mirrorless photography at a low price point. They would like a small camera, but not losing professional features at the same time. The IAF for both people and animals works really well. The R10 is very fast. High ISO and dynamic range performance is also very good. I also liked how many of the buttons can be customized, which made shooting more effective. Basically, it's a professional camera packaged into a quite cheap plastic body, to be honest. 
Video autofocus and quality of video footage is also on a professional level. Yes, the kit lens should have a faster aperture and should start wider, but other than these, it's okay. However, if your budget allows, I recommend getting the 18 to 150 mm lens because of the extra reach and because of the better image stabilization. So that was my review of the Canon EOS R10 camera. I hope you enjoyed it. It would mean a world to me if you subscribe to my channel and also press the thumbs up button. And if you'd like to see why I'm mostly using aperture priority mode, then check this video out. And also don't forget to download the sample raw images under the video. See you soon and all the best from Hungary.